Good morning. Well, it's good to be back. As you know, I've been out of town the last couple of weeks. Uh, two weeks ago, I was at The Haven, formerly known as Elms Haven at St. Helena, California, where we did a uh, seminar, and it was fantastically received. Uh, we uh, presented uh, the God-Shaped Brain uh, seminar, God in Your Brain seminar, and uh, this is the sixth time I've presented it live, and you know that's, uh, this is the, what's on our DVD here, and every time I've presented it, Singapore, Australia, uh, here when we did it, uh, at the ACC, and then at, at Helena, St. Helena, at the end of the second presentation on the uh, designer or dictator, when I ask people to come and worship the designer and reject the dictator views of God, every time the audience is spontaneously erupted into applause. There's such a freeing message to see God in his true light and as the designer and not the dictator. And so it's really, really resonating with the audiences out there. And uh, on that note, I'll go ahead and, and remind you that these are to be used as literature. Uh, we've got uh, several cases of them out here. If you know people you want to hand them to that will watch them, then take as many as you like. And we've already distributed around the world over 4,400 of these in a little more than a month. And uh, so we're still getting requests, and we ship them. At, so if you're online and you want some for your church, you have people you can share them with, we ship them at no cost. So we, these are free. We'll send them to you because we really believe this message is the message that's going to help uh, bring about the, the second coming. Um, last week I was at the East Cleveland Seventh-day Adventist Church and did a seminar with them, and it was, again, fantastically received. Very, very positive response to this view of God of love who's designed us to, to operate on the principles of love. So we're very happy about that. This uh, coming week, I would ask that you would really remember me in prayer on Monday and Tuesday because I've got the privilege of speaking to the leadership of 15 Baptist churches in Texas. There'll be about 200 leaders there, senior pastors, youth pastors, associate pastors, and so forth. And uh, they, uh, I'm going to present to them about God and your brain, how your view of God actually changes your brain. So remember me on Monday and Tuesday that I can speak clearly. And remember also we have the Vibrant Life magazine out here. If you have a local church that uh, might benefit from putting these in their lobby, there's uh, the last of them are out there on the desk. Uh, take a handful or take a stack and uh, go ahead and distribute. This is the, uh, this is the, uh, the January 2014 edition, and there is an article in here that I wrote on how your view of God affects your brain. So you can have that. And then last announcement this morning. How many have seen this book already? This is Servant God. This has been a long time coming. Um, it's published by Loma Linda University Press. Uh, it's got 19 authors, different, different chapters by 19 different authors. I wrote chapter two in this book, and uh, it was edited by Brad and Dorothy Cole, neurologists at Loma Linda. It's a fantastic book on uh, Servant God, the cosmic conflict over God's trustworthiness. So if you ha haven't got it, it's available on Amazon.com if you haven't got yourself a copy of it already. So let me put all this back here. <clears throat> and let's go ahead and begin class with prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your character and kingdom of love and the way you run your universe, the principles of truth and love. We thank you for the privilege of knowing you and sharing this, the beauty of your methods with others. We pray you'll be with us today, enlighten our minds, and give us the effectiveness to share this message around the world. We pray in your holy name. Amen. And we're doing lesson number six in the quarterly discipleship. And the title this week is Discipling the Ordinary. Discipling the Ordinary. And in the first paragraph, it says, Christ's death was the great equalizer. It showed that we all are sinners in need of God's grace. In light of the cross, ethnic, political, economic, and social barriers crumble. Sometimes, though, in our soul winning, we forget the crucial truth, and we especially seek to win those who might be deemed honorable or great in the eyes of the world. And as I read that, I thought, well, certainly for the believer, it, it is true that at the foot of the cross there's no difference. All are sinners at the foot of the cross. But what about for those who don't believe in Christ? Is, the, is Christ's death the great equalizer for those who have not accepted Christ? If you present Christ and say, see, at the foot of the cross to the, somebody who doesn't believe in God, will it... So does, does the Bible actually present or give us another tool that is useful in bringing people to realize that they're no better than anyone else? Is there another tool the Bible gives besides the foot of the cross? How about the written law? The Ten Commandments that diagnose 
that expose the defects that reveal our shortcomings. And whether one believes in Jesus, believes in the Bible or not, if one actually looks at the principles of the law. And people don't have to, to believe in God to look at the principles of the law and understand what love is. If you love somebody, you don't lie. If you love somebody, you don't murder. If you love somebody, you don't cheat. If you love somebody, you can look at those principles. And, and regardless of their belief, if they examine themselves in light of the, the diagnostic efficacy of the law, do they find out that, in fact, they fall short. And this is, of course, the purpose. The law was given not as a treatment, but as a diagnostic tool to reveal how short we fall. Whereas the death of Christ reveals and provides the remedy to the condition. Notice the difference. The law diagnoses what's wrong. Christ reveals and provides remedy to what's wrong. Those who have not yet realized their condition don't seek remedy. Christ said he didn't come to save those who are well, but those who are sick. If we don't know we have a problem, we don't seek the solution. Does that make sense? How do you explain <clears throat> to Jews who carried the written law? Yeah, that's... What was the basis of their rejection? Perfect question. When we present the law as a list of rules imposed by a God who's waiting to punish if we disobey, we present the law this way, then how does evangelism usually work out? Seriously. You go out and say, God's got a bunch of rules, and if you don't keep them, then he's going to be required by holiness to kill you, and he punishes the wicked, and he rewards the, the righteous. Pardon? Oh, that's, what, that's what Jesus said. When you, when you search the world to get a convert, you make him twice the son of hell when you convert them to this pharisaical, legalistic, imposed law construct of God. You darken their minds even further. And this is why they rejected him, because they accepted the law under an imposed construct rather than under the creator-designer construct. But if we present the law as the design protocols upon which life is constructed, and how deviations damage the deviant. When you deviate, you damage yourself. While God is working to heal, then how does evangelism work? And I can tell you my practice, it works phenomenally. I have patients come in to see me all the time who have raised in a religious belief system that was rules-oriented. Fear-based. Fear-based. And many of them either... I don't really know if I believe in God anymore, or I don't, I don't believe in God anymore. And when we talk about it, it's because of this very irrational, arbitrary system of rules with a God who's just waiting to punish. And when we step back and say, well, do you believe in the laws of health? The laws of gravity, the laws of thermodynamics, and, and the design protocol laws. And, and when you deviate from that, what happens? We start walking them through the cause and effect relationship between how things were designed. And when you deviate from that design, suddenly a new light dawns in their mind. And when they see that we're born in a condition that we didn't choose and that the designer is trying to fix it, this God is, a, is an appealing God for most of them. But they have to get, they have to shed themselves of this dictator view that is ubiquitous around the world. I mean, it's so entrenched into our thinking. It's almost deeply, as deeply wired in as English language is for you. When you get up in the morning, do you have to think to speak in English? I'm going to think in English today. I'm going to speak in English. No, it's automatic. It's so deeply wired in people almost automatically see the world through this distortion. And this is why they live in fear. What about what, what the lesson suggests that we seek to win those who are great in the world? What are, any, any thoughts about that? <clears throat> Well, the next paragraph says regarding that idea, not so with Jesus, who saw the meaninglessness and emptiness of worldly greatness and honor. In fact, in many cases, it was the most successful people, the favorable, favorably positioned Pharisees, the wealthy Sadducees, and the Roman aristocracy, who troubled him the most. In contrast, the ordinary people, carpenters, fishermen, farmers, housewives, shepherds, soldiers, and servants, generally thronged and embraced him. <clears throat> what about today? What kind of a God appeals to those who prefer the methods of the world? Would they... Those are the rulers, these people who have power now. Power over God, I like it, a power over God. Would they look for a God who would come to use his power to hurt their enemies? What were the Jews looking for 2,000 years ago? 
Okay. This is uh, March 5, 2006, Louis Farrakhan. Anybody heard of Louis Farrakhan? Yes. Um, this is a quote from him. We're living at a time that was described by Jesus in these words. If those days were not shortened for his elect's sake, no flesh would be saved. We know that we have now entered that period when we witnessed the tsunami killing over 200,000 people in Asia, an earthquake in Pakistan, storms raging through America, fire on one side, water on the other, snow, cold, ice in between. At a town hall meeting in New Orleans, I, was, I pointed out the high black-on-black -black crime rates, rebellion against the will and law of God, and the love of partying and acting foolishness that prevails in the city. I asked them if they did not think that Allah, God, would handle the city as he did those two ancient cities that lived in rebellion. I told them Allah brought a punishment to America, but he also brought a punishment to black people, and that punishment is going to spread. There will be many more disasters than, that we are not prepared for in this country. This country glories in its cities and skyscrapers, but Allah is going to bring them down. We are going to know that he is God. The Bible says that in his second coming, he will have a sword dripping with blood in his hand. He is not coming back to teach. He is coming back to kill the enemies of his teaching and set up a new government. What do you all think? <laughs> do you think this is exclusive to people in Islam? Uh, do was that quote in that uh, Bible study that uh, Dorothy and Brad just did about the, the some mega church preacher said that Christ is coming back with a tattoo on his leg and he's coming to kick butt and take names and that's the kind of God I can get behind. I, I don't believe in a God that I can beat up. Yeah, how many of us, exactly, how many of us have heard preached from our own pulpits the idea that God is coming back to use his power to kill and to destroy? If people prefer the methods of the world to God's true methods, how do they then present, and they worship a God like this, how do they then treat others? Do they like to present a God who forgives freely, who pardons without payment. No. See, when you have this distortion about God, you actually present a God who has to be paid, to be bought off by the blood of his son, is, the, is ultimately the, 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 the currency that is used. Uh, the, the idea of the, of the world has, has corrupted the church, by presenting God's law like human law, and God like a dictator inflicts pain and suffering upon the disobedient. But this isn't restricted to Christianity. Believers of other religions have the same corrupted misunderstanding of God's law. Thus, when people believe that God uses force to get his way, they use similar methods. Look at the history of Christianity since Constantine, Crusades, Inquisition, burning people at the stake. But is physical violence the only way that the methods of the world corrupt the way we practice our, our religion if we accept this disorder law, law concept. How else is it corrupt besides violence? What about coercion? Do you ever see coercion used in the church? Coercive pressure? Think about how the, the governments of the world, remember Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. My ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And how do the earthly governments work? Have you ever heard of sanctions? What are sanctions designed to do? To coerce. To pressure. To, to make people do it your way. What about intimidation and fear tactics? The governments of the world use fear tactics? What about making our decisions for Christ based on fear? How many evangelists get up there and say, if you leave this session day and you get hit by a car, this could be your last chance, and they use the fear tactics to coerce. Yeah, I saw there's something called the book. Yeah. The church, and hundreds stood up. But, uh, it was that fear that they'd be judged. Mm -hmm. Think about this. What kind, what, think about that if, remember, the, the relationship God wants with his people is described in scripture with the metaphor of a bride 
and the groom. Christ the bridegroom, the church, the people, the bride. Imagine if a bridegroom sought his bride with those tactics. Fear. If you don't, I'll punish or whatever. Does that, does that engender love? Did Jesus ever use fear tactics when he was here on earth? Do you see him using fear tactics? He did not. And Jesus said, if you see me, you've seen the Father. But I know someone, someone either in, in internet world or in here is thinking, well, okay, well then what about the Old Testament? What about the Old Testament? Uh, God thundered at Sinai. If he didn't use fear tactics, what do, we, what do we understand there? Was God using fear tactics at Sinai? Well, go back and read the passage in Exodus 20. As God thundered and all the people were afraid, Moses is standing there and Moses says, quote, there is no need for you to be afraid, unquote. Now, why, if God was using fear tactics, would Moses tell them they don't need to be afraid? Because he knew God. So the point is, was God using fear tactics? Their fear was not because God was using fear tactics. Their fear was coming from them. As soon as Adam and Eve sinned, they ran and hid because they were afraid. afraid. God came gently to them, but they were still afraid. God wasn't using fear tactics. Sin causes fear in the hearts of those who are not reconciled to God. Fear doesn't come out from God. He's not trying to motivate with fear. Oh, well, what about the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom? How do we deal with that if God isn't using fear tactics? Ah, perfect love casts out all fear. So there's two ways to understand, I think, of the fear of the, uh, the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. One, it can be understood in, in the idea of awe, reverence, and admiration. When we awe and reverence God, then we begin in. But it can also be understood in, in, this, in this situation at Sinai. If you're in the middle of an orgy worshiping a golden calf, destroying your own self with his hedonistic self-abuse, and God thunders to get your attention, and you realize, oh, no, what am I doing? And you become afraid, and you stop doing it. Wisdom has begun. It's not the end of wisdom. It's the beginning. It's when you start a new trap. It's when you turn around from self-destruction. Wisdom has begun. But God doesn't want us to be afraid. Every time an angel comes to one of God's prophets or spokespersons, and they fall down afraid, what does the angel say every time? What did he say to the, to the shepherds out when the angels came to announce Christ's coming? What did he say to the angel that came to, to Zechariah uh, in, in the temple to announce about John? What did they say to Mary when the angel, every time an angel comes, what did they say? Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. God's methods are to take away our fear. Overemphasize that God wants to be your friend. Exactly right. But we have this idea about God and we teach it in church that we should be afraid of God. It's a lie. It is an absolute lie. We should be afraid of sin. But people are more afraid of God who's trying to save them than sin which is destroying them. Do you realize that? People are much more comfortable with their sin than they are with God. Is it not true? In chapter 3 of this new book, Servant God, the question of suffering is explored and what is God's role in it? Does he actually use his power to inflict suffering? And the book points out how Jesus taught that natural disasters were not from God. Remember the, the um, Tower of Siloam? When it fell, they asked, and all these 15 people were killed in it. And Jesus did not attribute this to an act of God at all. And then on page 59, it says the following. Two events in the Bible that are attributed to God, the flood and the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, came with, much, came with much warning and an active rescue effort on God's part to save his children from these natural disasters. In fact, rather than interpreting these events as God's retributive punishment, the narrative reveals a God who is actively trying to rescue his people from being engulfed by their dark spiritual surroundings. The Bible records instances when God disciplined people to prevent greater harm. What we can be sure of, however, is that God in human form never inflicted physical suffering on anyone. In other words, Jesus never inflicted physical harm on anyone. Also significant is that Jesus rebuked his disciples when they wanted to call fire down to destroy the, the rebellious. 
You, did you get that idea, Sodom and Gomorrah, which is often pointed to as evidence of God destroying? In both instances, God had an active redemption rescue plan going on that was preached and preached and preached and begged and pled and begged and they rejected the rescue plan. This is why there was, God wasn't seeking to destroy, he's seeking to save, but they wouldn't have it. This is what will happen at the end of time when the wicked are lost in the end. Right now, is there not an active rescue plan going on on earth right now? Isn't there a message to be going forth that tells people, hey, uh, uh, there's a healing remedy, partake, you don't have to suffer in the way you suffer. Other methods that infect the church when we accept the distortion about God. What about lying? What about lying? How about this one? Uh, do the values of the, of the methods of the world, do they, do, uh, that they lie, do they enter the church? What about a pastor who was fired from his job because he wants to present a loving picture of God because a senior pastor preser- pre- preser- pre- prefers a more punitive version of God, so he dismisses the, the associate pastor, but after firing him, he tells the congregation that the associate pastor took a call. <laughs> to another church. Is that true? Have you ever seen that happen? I didn't make this up. I know this to be a fact. For d- d- is this the methods of God? Does he lie? Does he misrepresent? Why would, they ne- why would the senior pastor need to lie to his congregation? Because he knows he's wrong. And he knows if he told the truth, there would be a problem. People lie because they're afraid. What is it that motivates people to lie? It's always fear. It's always a need to protect self. Self Self-preservation, self-centeredness. It's always the case. How can we expect to win people to God's kingdom of love if we present a church that operates no differently from the world? In other words, why leave the world with its domination over coercion, deceit, manipulation, and come into a religion that uses the exact same methods, albeit while claiming the penalty was paid by Jesus on the cross? But otherwise, it operates the same. But now with a whole new list of rules that you better do or else. Why come into that organization? Sunday, first paragraph. It says, Joseph and Mary's purification offering clearly indicated their economically poor background. This tradition sprang from the Mosaic legislation recorded in Leviticus 12.8, and it required that a lamb be brought for this offering. However, a compassionate exemption had been provided for the impoverished people. Turtle doves or pigeons could be substituted because of humble circumstances. Thus, right from the start, from his birth in a stable to the offering given by his parents, Jesus is portrayed as having assumed his humanity in the home of poor and ordinary people. In fact, archaeological evidence also seems to indicate that the town of Nazareth, where Jesus spent his childhood, was relatively impoverished and unimportant town as well. And though carpentry is an honorable trade, it certainly didn't place him among the elite. They're suggesting here that Joseph and Mary were ordinary people. Do you think Joseph and Mary are ordinary or extraordinary? See, man looks on the outward appearance, but Lord looks on the heart. While it's true regarding wealth, position, rank, skill set, perhaps they were ordinary in society. But what about regarding character? What about regarding character? Were they ordinary? She, she said if it wasn't extraordinary, it wouldn't have been chosen. Think about this. Was it, what would an ordinary man in that culture have done if his fiance comes up pregnant by someone other than him? What would an ordinary man have done? Yeah, this was extraordinary. Joseph was extraordinary, wasn't he? And what about a woman? What would an ordinary woman have done with the proposal to become pregnant out of wedlock in that society? Knowing what her reputation might suffer and how she might be treated. Stoned to death. Yeah, very likely be stoned to death. Yeah. So I think, I think in fact, they were extraordinary in character. Yes, in the back. Uh, this is related to the fear concept that you were talking about a few moments ago. Um, what about at the end of Exodus uh, 19, where the people were not permitted to approach Mount Sinai? Yeah, what about it? That's all they're asking. Now, were they not approaching because of fear? Why were they not approaching is the question. 
Why were they not permitted? Because God's love. Because of love. He wanted to protect them. Why is it that God said to Moses, take the same principle just a, a little further into the boundary? Moses could approach, but when Moses said, let me see your face, God said, no one can see my face and live. Which means if I catch a peek and I'll have to kill you? No, it means that their condition wouldn't permit it. Their condition with their rebellious heart, when Moses came off the mountain reflecting the radiance of God's presence, they couldn't even tolerate that, and they begged for him to put a veil over. So the boundary wasn't there to make them afraid. The boundary was there to protect them because they couldn't tolerate coming into his presence. It would have killed them in their unruly state. Last paragraph, it says, The parents of Jesus were poor, dependent upon their daily toil. He was familiar with poverty, self-denial, and privation. This experience was a safeguard to him. In his industrious life, there were no idle moments to invite temptation. No aimless hours opened the way for corrupting associations. So far as possible, he closed the door to the tempter. Neither gain nor pleasure, applause nor censor, could induce him to consent to a wrong act. He was wise to discern evil and strong to resist it. Are there lessons for us in this paragraph? Lessons for us in this paragraph. Where do we draw the lines between providing for our children and providing work for our children? In other words, do we pay the tuition or do we require them to get a job and work their way through school so they won't have idle time? They won't hang out with the wrong associations. I mean, where do you draw the line? There's a line to be drawn, and every, every situation is unique. There's not a cookie-cutter rule that you can say, this child needs this much, this child needs the other. It's, it's, a, it's a discernment thing. Some, child, some children need all the time they have for study. Other children don't need that much. They need to work because <laughs> they can get their studies done more rapidly, and they'll have a lot of free time to goof around. Isn't it true? Okay. Yeah. Work. Pardon? You work. I worked. <laughs> I worked. <laughs> yes, the mother was saying I had too much time to goof around, huh? <laughs> um, do we set character development as the number one goal for ourselves and our children? Or do we have other things that we put before it? Like education, awards, making money, retirement plan, position, do we experience ourselves and others as successful if they are not wealthy or highly educated? Are they still successful? Do we experience ourselves and others successful if they are mature and Christ-like in character? Is that the primary standard you look to when you look to other people? Or do we look to the positions they gain in the world? When was the last time in the Southern Tidings did you read, so-and-so was recognized as having a Christ-like character? <laughs> they loved well. They sacrificed to help others. When was the last time you saw that? Even in the church, do we not recognize? You see, they were recognized. They got award, the governor's award for this. They got the, this award for that. They got a, you know, this prize for this. No, there's nothing wrong with those things. But do we send the message that you're successful if you get worldly recognition? Often acts of humbleness and, and uh, that unselfish love, though, fly under the radar because it's not done with a look at me, look at me, specifically. That's right. It just is love rippling out. That's exactly right. That's exact. Well said. Um, I have patients who feel their failure because they've lost a job, have had to file bankruptcy, lost their home, lost a relationship, break up or divorce, and they feel like they're a failure. Are any of these things a measure of failure or success? No. Why not? Why are they not a measure of failure or success? It's how you handle it. Oh, did you hear what he said? How you handle it is the measure, not the experience. That's well said. So let's consider some, some, some people maybe through history that were considered to be successful. I'll throw the first three out. Enoch, Elijah, and Moses. But they're all in heaven. I think we can say they succeeded. <laughs> Anybody argue with that one? Playing it safe. Playing it safe. Okay. Well, this is, this is the obvious, right? They're successful, right? How about Daniel and John? 
What about David, Solomon, and Manasseh? What about Rahab, Mary Magdalene, and the thief on the cross? How could a murderer, polygamist, idol worshiper who sacrificed his own son, a prostitute, and a thief be successful? David, the, the murderer, and polygamist. Solomon, the polygamist, sacrificed one of his sons to a false idol. And so did Manasseh, sacrificed his son to a false idol. The two prostitutes, a thief. How could they be, do we consider them successful or a failure? Successful. How could they be successful? How could that be? So what what are you saying determines success or failure in our lives? After the sinner has sinned, what do you do with that? After the sinner has sinned, wait a second. Don't, aren't you a little farther downstream already? <laughs> how about how about instead of after the sinner has sinned, how about after the sinner is born? <laughs> We're born in sin. Conceived in iniquity. Which one of us? When did you choose to be a sinner? You did. Get your mind around this idea. See, the, the, uh, and I'm not picking on you, but the way you phrased it is evidence of how we have been inculcated with an imposed law construct. It was behavior focused after the sinner has sinned, after we have done a bad deed, after we have awareness of our condition. Okay. But, that, but that, that original way you said it is the way most people think. Exactly. After you've done a bad deed. But the reality is we're born in a, with a condition we didn't choose. And the bad deeds that I focused on, the polygamy, the murder, the adultery, all these things, those bad deeds are symptoms of the condition of heart. Jesus said in Matthew 5, you say if you commit adultery, bad act, you commit sin. I say if you look at a woman with lust in your heart. You say if you commit murder, bad act, you commit sin. I say if you... Hate your brother in your heart. You see, the person who commits the bad act, and if you read in the book Steps to Christ, Ellen White says that even with God there is a degree of, of sin. Not all sin is equal in God's eyes. Now we look at the, the, the adulterer, the drunkard, and the more grosser sins and think they're the worst, but in God's eyes they're not the worst. The worst sins are arrogance and pride. Because they don't recognize their need. Okay? And so the, the prostitute, the murderer, David, after he, he did this thing, he was convicted and recognized how sick he was. Rahab, Mary, Mary Magdalene, they recognized the need. But the Pharisees who put Christ on the cross, they kept the rules, the behavior. Hey, we have, we have never had our TV on after sunset on Friday. <laughs> Well, that's 3 ABN, that's right. <laughs> Just 3 ABN. Okay? We have never gotten gas in our car on Sabbath. We've never eaten at a restaurant on Sabbath. We've kept the rules. Therefore, we're righteous. This is the Pharisees. They strained the gnat out of their food. They wouldn't walk so many steps. They pinned their handkerchief to their clothing because they wouldn't carry it because that would be work on Sabbath. They kept the rules. They're righteous, right? And they looked down at Mary Magdala. She should be stoned. She's a sinner. But Jesus said the prostitutes and tax collectors are going into the kingdom before you. How could that be? Because he was looking at the heart and he knew that the symptoms that they were doing were symptoms of a heart. And when the heart is changed, guess what happens to the behavior? Yes. Uh, too, too often, people act in response to uh, what they consider a need rather than in response to a responsibility. And there are times when we do things that we must do because of responsibility. That in other circumstances, with the same thing, might be totally inappropriate and could be considered sinful. Yeah, I, 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 what you said opens up so many trails in my brain just now. Yeah, like responsibility. Doesn't our, how we judge our responsibility go right back to how we understand God and his methods and laws? 
So, for instance, didn't the Pharisees in Christ's day feel it was their responsibility to uphold the law of Moses and that woman should be stoned? But Jesus had the responsibility to save and heal those who were lost. That's right. So his responsibility was to deliver and forgive her, not to stone her. Their responsibility was because they had a different concept of what righteousness and justice looked like based on a different law construct. I don't disagree with you in principle, but won't your found foundation of, of what you base right and wrong upon determine what your responsibilities are? Right. Well, look at Joseph before the book of Moses. What he acted out the laws was. Joseph, after he was sold by his brothers into slavery. I mean, his whole, I mean, his, his heart shone through. Well said. What worship his love of God. He wouldn't betray his, his, his slave master, that he was unrighteously put in there, sold unjustly into slavery. He knew he shouldn't be a slave, but he still wouldn't betray his slave master, would he? And cheat, and cheat with his wife. And he forgave his brothers. And he forgave his brothers. Which is powerful. He, notice he forgave them, but he didn't trust them. <laughs> That's a great point to recognize. Forgiveness doesn't mean you trust. Well, he had him bring the younger brother. Yeah, he, he tested them, didn't he? So, what about Caiaphas and well, these examples? I, I went what about Caiaphas and Annas? You know who they were? High priests of their day. If they were members of our local church, how would we esteem them if they lived their lives like they did back then? They would probably be senior pastors. Wouldn't they? Chosen by God. Chosen by God that we should never question. Yeah. Because man looks where? On the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. In our culture today, what does success look like in our culture? Becoming president of the United States, winning the Super Bowl, getting gold medals in the Olympics, or sharing the true picture of God and practicing its methods of love? What actually does success look like to you? Where is your goal? Where is your heart? Where is your passion? To live like Christ and look like him or to get that gold at the Olympics? It seems to me that what determines success is whether one partakes of Jesus Christ. And the sooner one does so in their life and are reconciled to him, then the more success they have both individually and how they're able to help other people through life. The thief accepted Christ and ultimately his personal life ended up a success. But how much good did he do with his life throughout his life? You see, the sooner we take the remedy, then the sooner we can be a positive influence for the kingdom. Monday's lesson, third paragraph, says, So often Jesus sought people who were considered to be ordinary because lacking self-sufficiency, they were, pre they were prepared to trust God completely for their success. People who are enamored by their talents, abilities, and accomplishments cannot often sense their need of something greater than themselves. What a horrible deception. Many among Christ's contemporaries possess superior academic training, social position, or personal wealth. Nevertheless, their names have long been forgotten. Remembered, however, are ordinary people, farmers, fishermen, carpenters, shepherds, potters, housewives, domestic servants, who were transformed into extraordinary witnesses for Christ. Takeaway from this paragraph, the takeaway point, is that if we depend on ourselves and not Christ, we ultimately fail. That's the takeaway here. Those who depend on Christ, however, ultimately succeed. That's the takeaway of this paragraph. But it seemed to me there were a couple of premises in this paragraph that we could, could explore. For instance, in the very first sentence, it said that ordinary people lack self-sufficiency. Do you all believe that's true? That ordinary people, people of regular means, not wealthy, not powerful, lack self-sufficiency. They have to live self-sufficiency to, to make it day by day, even more so. And who actually is an ordinary person anyway? 1997, I was getting out of the military and I was interviewing uh, uh, with, a, with a headhunting company and they sent me to a hospital in South Georgia called Phoebe Putnam to interview. And, and they had an all-day interview set up with different people. And, and part of the day, they had set aside a couple hours for me to go with a real estate agent to see the properties and where I could potentially live, trying to show me how great the community is and so forth. And this real estate agent had done this with many doctors the hospital recruited and been out with about an hour and a half with this lady driving around. And she finally says to me, what's your specialty anyway? And I said, psychiatry. And she looked at me and she goes, well, you're kind of regular for a psychiatrist. <laughs> I'm exactly right. I thought it was one of the best compliments I ever got. I said, oh, thank you. <laughs> so, so I'm kind of ordinary. I'm kind of ordinary. Regular. Um, why is it sometimes difficult to reach those with wealth and power? 
But I don't want to lose it. Okay, so one, one aspect is um, those that are struggling with financial or health problems have come up against the reality of their own human limitations. I can't get out of this mess that I'm in. And thus, this motivates them to look beyond self. And so the circumstances of the impoverished or the sick will often bring them to the point to realize, hey, I've got to have help outside me. Those with great means, however, may not get to that limitation of their own, uh, the, 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 the boundary of their own limitation as quickly. They may need more circumstances to bring them to that point. That's one, one reason. I also thought of a potential another reason. How about this? People with power and wealth have been conditioned to be skeptical from all the people coming with their hands out and wanting something. And those with little means, while self-sufficient, aren't as jaded because they haven't been approached by as many scams and con men. Or even the multiplicity of actually genuine and legitimate charities requesting something. So could ordinary people be let, more open and less guarded? And could they also be more vulnerable to flattery, the flattery being valued and needed? Possible? Bottom green section. says we all tend to be a little enamored by the very successful and the very rich, don't we? Did Jesus ever become an icon of his time? That people flocked to him to see a show? Did he? How did he handle it? Humility. He withdrew. Uh, Wendell. He knew the heart of man, so it talks about it, so that he was not impressed, but he knew the heart of man. That's right. So he wasn't going to let the flattery and the adoration of, of uh, icon worship. They weren't worshiping because they saw his character, some of them. They were worshiping like we worship the Hollywood person. Some of them were. They worshiped the food. The food. He said that. He also said that. They came for the food. They came for the show. And oftentimes he would withdraw from them and seek to go somewhere else where he wasn't as well known, where they would listen to what he had to say, not come to see him because of the, the personal reputation of, uh, of an entertainer that has arrived. A miracle worker. The popularity. the popularity factor. Yeah, exactly. Tuesday's lesson is about Peter and his experiences with Christ. When you think of Peter, do you see some of yourself in there? I like Peter. Did you know that, uh, does the history of Peter encourage or discourage you? See, Peter was perhaps the most impulsive of the disciples. He would blurt things out. He would jump right out of the boat when he saw Jesus. He asked to walk on the water, and as soon as he was out on the water, he couldn't keep his eyes on Christ. He looked around and then started sinking and falling and panicking. He might, sounds like Peter had ADHD. <laughs> Doesn't it, really? He was impulsive. He couldn't stay focused on one thing for more than a second. You know? <laughs> but what was necessary for Peter to become effective for Jesus? In the upper room when... When Jesus said, you're all going to betray me, Peter blurts out. First one, blurted out. Not me, Lord. Uh-uh, I'm going to be there. Was Peter lying? No, he thought that. So Jesus had every confidence in him because he was telling the truth. No. No. Jesus told him when he was converted. Yeah, Jesus said when you're converted, you must be. So Peter meant it, but Jesus still couldn't trust him because did Peter love Jesus? But he still loved himself more. That was the key. And at that night, when he was being threatened, his love for self and need to protect self rose up and he denied Christ to protect self. That's when he went out and wept bitterly, died to self. And he wasn't perfect after that point, but he didn't deny Christ anymore to protect himself. Yes, Wendell. The, um, the bottom two paragraphs in Tuesday's lesson, it talks about Peter and Christ's relationship with him. I just thought it was a good exercise to replace the word Peter with Judas in those two paragraphs. How would it be any different? Yeah, that's an excellent point. You read the, in the book of Desire of Ages the, the chapter on Judas. It's quite humbling because you could easily put yourself in there. I've read this. Wow. Oh, wow. So easily. Judas had all these experiences and all these evidences. Hmm. 
well, it's very, very humbling to realize. Did the Apostle of the Jews did not fully see Jesus until he realized what he had done? And then he fully grasped what you know, Jesus, why we were saying? Yeah, I think G Judas believed Jesus was God's son, but he didn't think Jesus was as smart as Judas. And Judas probably, I believe, thinks, thought that he needed Judas, Jesus needed Judas' help to get to the throne. Judas. And Judas still conceived of God's kingdom as the power over kingdom. And having been there when Jesus, multiple times, if you remember throughout the Gospels, they, they picked up stones to stone him, and Jesus just disappeared from them. You read the Gospels, it happened multiple times. He saw that. He saw him raise Lazarus from the dead. He saw him feed the 5,000. He saw him walk on water. I think Judas believed that when he betrayed Jesus, he would force his hand. He would corner him, and then Jesus would be forced to use his power to throw off their power to take the throne. I don't think he ever intended for Jesus to die. This is why he was sick and threw the money down. But he never loved Jesus' methods and kingdom either. And thus he was overcome with his own selfishness. And if Jesus would have corn been cornered and used his power to throw him off, Jesus, Jesus would have stepped up, but his arm and see, I got you here. This was Judas' plan. He didn't understand God's kingdom. Power over. Um, Wednesday's lesson asks us to read Matthew uh, 6, 25 through 30. And this is Jesus speaking. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life or what you will eat or drink or about your body and what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you by worrying can add a single day to, a single hour to, to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which are here today and tomorrow is thrown in the fire, how much more will he clothe you? O oh, you of little faith. Do we worry? I see lots of worries in my office. Do we worry? About what do we worry? Do you, do you notice Christ's question uh, here? Can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? In fact, the data shows that those who worry shorten their life. When you worry, you activate your inflammatory cascades of your body, causing a, a, an acceleration of stress hormones, which accelerates your death. You shorten your life by worry. Thanks for that reinforcing. <laughs> so are you going to worry about worrying? I worry about all my worry. I'm worrying that I'm worrying too much. <laughs> Does worry solve any problem? Does worry increase faith, trust, and peace? Do you notice, have you ever stepped back to notice, the things we worry about are actually things that are not our responsibility. We don't worry about the stuff that's ours. We worry about the stuff that's not ours. Let me give you an example. How many worry about what others think of us? About what? Uh, worry about what others think of us. Oh. We are not responsible for what others think. We are responsible for what we think and how we act. Responsible for what we think and how we act, not what others think of us. You can't tell how many people are caught up in fear of what others think of them, and they worry about it. Or worry whether we're liked or not. We're not responsible for whether others like us. We are responsible for whether we are like Christ. That's what we're responsible for. Look at Christ. Many of them didn't like him. They even killed him. That wasn't his worry. That wasn't his, he didn't worry about that. How about, pardon? The serenity prayer. The serenity prayer, yeah. How about how many of us worry how our children will turn out? We are not responsible for how they turn out. We are responsible for our conduct in parenting. How we govern ourselves in parenting is what we're responsible for, not how they turn out. Do you all realize that? There are influences, so many influences beyond the control of the parent. Think about that. Think, I, I, could go, I have so many scenarios running through my mind that the parent has no control over that can influence the outcome. Your, car, your child is, is in a car wreck and sees their best friend killed at age 10. Do you think that could affect the child? 
I know a true story of a child at age, I think, 13, was going to a slumber party with her best friend. The mother was driving. The mother of the best friend was driving. The mother of the child was not in the car. And there was a car accident. Best friend was killed, and mother was cut in half in this very bit. And the child was trapped for three hours in there with half the mother's body before they could get the jaws of life and get the child out. Do you think it affected her? <laughs> yes, he's had terrible trauma issues since then. Fear issues, anxiety issues. Did, it, it, does that mean the mother who let the child go to the, to the slumber party was a bad mother? No. Yeah, see, there are so many things that affect outcomes that parents have no control over. And this is one of our worries. We worry how life will turn out. We worry about outcomes in general. Worry about whether we're going to get in a certain school or hired for a certain job. It's not our responsibility if we get hired or get accepted. Our responsibility is preparing ourselves, applying, and presenting ourselves in the most favorable way. But whether we get in or not, it's not ours. It's not up to us. Whether a sickness gets cured or a lo- in us or a loved one, we're not responsible how a sickness turns out, but for living in harmony with God's methods and principles for health and doing all in our power to bring healing. But how it turns out, it's not up to us. And ultimately, our worries come down to we don't trust God with how things turn out. That's where it comes down to. Are you willing, our responsibility is to choose to do in governance of ourselves, which is our duty to do. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego on the plains of Dura had a decision. Bow or don't bow. That was their decision to make. How it turned out was not up to them. I know how I think. I hope I would think like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but I, I, I'm afraid that what happened on the plain of Dura, when, that, when I was told I had to bow or go in the fiery furnace, I would think, I can't bow. That's adultery. I can't deny God. But I would think fiery furnaces are a non-starter. That's not an option. Fiery furnaces are out of the, out of the plan here. Okay? So I know what I'll do when the music plays. I'll tie my shoe. <laughs> Isn't this how we think? But see, if you do that, there is no peace. There's only worry. Why? Because if you tie your shoe in that circumstance, you worry that God knows your heart and you really weren't standing for him, so you're afraid if he can be on your side now, and maybe you betrayed him anyway. And you worry that somebody on the other side might have seen that you were tying your shoe and not bow, and they're going to report you for not bowing anyway. And so you got worry on both sides. <laughs> There's no peace either way. You're not loyal to anybody except self. And that only leads to more survival of the fittest, manipulation, plotting, and scamming. And this is what we do to ourselves. Am I wrong or right? right. Yes. Is anxiety uh, a sign of uh, lack of trust in God? Not necessarily, because anxiety can be a symptom of a brain problem. Mothers who um, are anxious or worried uh, or stressed, let's say stressed, during pregnancy, and it could be no fault of their own. It could be during pregnancy that uh, they're, they're married and their husband is a soldier and gets deployed into a, in a war zone. And as much as they trust God, they still have anxieties that they're, they're, they're dealing with, real-life stress. Or that one of their children is in an ICU while they're pregnant with their next child. There's just real-life stress they're dealing with. And when you have real-life stress, your brain releases uh, stress hormones that cause your adrenals to release uh, uh, catecholamines and, uh, and glucocorticoids. And those glucocorticoid hormones cross the placental barrier, cross the developing fetal blood-brain barrier, and alter the developing brain so the child is born with a fear circuitry, amygdala, that is less capable of calming itself. This child will be more anxious throughout life than had the mother not been stressed during pregnancy. A different structural brain because of this. So they may have anxiety issues to deal with, <clears throat> it has nothing to do with the fact they don't trust God or they do trust God. <clears throat> People who've been through trauma actually can have um, alterations in brain structure based on the trauma, combat zones. Uh, somebody's been raped, uh, these types of things. Children who were molested as kids have no power over what happens to them any more than you guys could control what language you learn. You had no control over what language you learned as a child. You were powerless to stop it. You couldn't have used your intelligence to say, I'm going to learn French as a child. You couldn't have done it. Same way when children are abused, it alters their brain structure such they actually have a structurally different brain that's more anxious and less capable of calming itself than children not abused. Interesting, there's a new medicine that's actually in research right now that shows in post-traumatic patients that it actually helps stop the, 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 the memories. Because I don't know if you know this, but memories are formed not just by neural circuit connections, but memories are formed with altering DNA and DNA structure. We, we, we remember the memories are all the way down in how the DNA is shaped. 
three-dimensional structure of your DNA is where your memory. And some of these medicines now we've, they've identified can actually alter the enzymes that affect that structural shape and the memories will be lost as the DNA structure shape. It's really fascinating new research that's out there. But I think we worry because we take outcomes upon ourselves and we try to force events to go the way we believe they should go. Yes or no? Yeah. yeah. Rather than trusting God with the outcome and trying to stay faithful to our duty and governance of ourselves. And I want to jump to Thursday. First paragraph. Thursday's lesson. It says, perhaps the most Perhaps the most socially attractive feature of primitive Christianity was the absence of class distinction. And I'm going to read the whole paragraph, but that's the idea. The absence of class. Really? This confused me a little bit because um, it suggests there was no class distinction in the primitive church, the early Christian church. But didn't they have slaves in Bible times? In fact, weren't the Christians, some of the Christian slave owners? And what about women in the early church? Hmm. Yeah, why did these disparities exist in the early church? Was it because slavery and bigotry to women were part of Christianity? Or were these issues part of the culture upon which Christianity was growing? Was Christianity supposed to incorporate slavery and bigotry or rise above it? How is Christianity done today? <laughs> did the early church have women pastors? Why not? I'm going to give you some reasons here. Because it violated God's will. Because people were biased by culture and were not yet enlightened, including the Bible writers. Absolutely, yes. Because elevating women could have, could, could have offended the unconverted and thus closed the minds of people to the gospel before they even had a chance to hear it. Or, get ready, could it have been that Actually, in that culture, women in religious circles were held in high esteem as cult priestesses and cult prostitutes. And Christianity wanted to distinguish itself from these perverse religions, thus they relegated women to non-leadership roles for the purpose of making the chastity of the Christian values understood to those outside the church. And the Christian women were gracious enough, like Jesus, who did not think equality with God was something to be grasped, but humbled himself in the form of a servant to take a secondary role to send this message to a perverse culture. They weren't leaders in the church. Deborah was a judge. She wasn't in the church. She was in the Old Testament, Israel. Oh, okay. Look at Lydia was a minister in social circumstances. She wasn't actually an administrator or leader in the church. Catholic church actually Just took structure from Jewish customs. Of so the Jews didn't hold women to power, even though Esther and other women were important. They, they did not... They didn't count in a minion, so therefore they, they were not significant within the church. And could it be a combination of all these events? Not just one single one. All these could have been influenced. But do we still struggle with some of these issues in Christianity today? Is our culture the same as it was 2,000 years ago? No. no. Do we still need, to, do, still need those same interventions that they needed 2,000 years ago? What about talking about no segregation, no classes. What about black conferences? <laughs> Why don't we have integrated churches? Why do we still segregate? What's the purpose of that? How, do we, how can we find unity in Christ with the beauty of the plurality of divergence? Think about a garden with multiple different flowers all growing, but it's orchestrated to be beautiful with lots of different, and each person is kind of like that flower. We bring our own beauty, but how do we integrate where we harmonize rather than, than conflict with each other? Well, I'll leave those questions for you to, to wrestle with. How can culture become an obstacle to presenting the gospel? How can it become an obstacle? I'll leave you with that to wrestle with this week. But I'm going to suggest to you that God's plan is to change the heart. And we have a unity of heart and love his methods. Then the, the, the distinctions and the prejudices fade, fade away. Those prejudices rise up and those divisions arise up when we feel personal offense because somebody isn't like us. That's when they rise up. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you didn't think equality with the Father is something to be grasped, but in fact, you surrendered everything 
and came down and took upon yourself our humanity and, and humbled yourself all the way to the form of a servant and humbled yourself all the way to the cross, giving your life that we could see the truth about you and you could achieve the remedy for our condition that we could never achieve. We open our hearts and ask that the Spirit will take all that you've done and, and reproduce it in us so it's no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. And we can have that new heart and right spirit. You will write that law of love upon the, the, the tablets of our hearts and minds. And we can go out with discernment, with wisdom, and with the spirit of truth and the spirit of love to represent this message to a dying world. We pray in your holy name. Amen. And please uh, remember to take...